Ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, a very good morning from Brussels. Uh, we are here today for the 15th ETSC PIN conference. It's a busy half a day that uh, we have ahead of us. We have published today the 15th PIN report, which is available online. We will present the figures. We will see how PIN countries have done in the last 10 years. And afterwards, we will announce the winner of uh, the PIN award. We will also have uh, a presentation from uh, the Deputy Minister for Infrastructure of the country that has been awarded the PIN. And we will continue with uh, a um, keynote speech from uh, um, Matthew Baldwin, who is uh, EU coordinator for uh, road safety and sustainable mobility and from uh, MEP Elena Contura, who is uh, um, the Rapporteur for the European Parliament Own Initiative Report on Road Safety. After a short break, we will then uh, continue with a very interesting panel uh, discussion, um, where uh, um, a set of distinguished experts will uh, uh, discuss under the chair of uh, David Ward, on the steps that need to be taken on the road to 2030 if we are to achieve the new targets to reduce by half the number of road deaths and the number of serious injuries. Throughout the conference, you can send your questions to our special guests by um, using the Q&A button in the Zoom control panel. But let's start with the, the PIN program. The PIN program has been ranking road safety performance across the participating countries since the year 2006. Please allow me some time to thank the PIN project partners without whom the activities we are running would not be possible. And namely the DBR, the German Road Safety Council, Toyota Motor Europe, the Swedish Transport Administration, the Norwegian Public Roads Administration and CETA, the International Vehicle Inspection Committee. A few words about the structure of uh, the PIN program. We do not only monitor the performance of uh, the EU member states, but actually we have uh, 32 PIN countries. That is the 27 from the EU, as well as the UK, former member of the EU, and Switzerland, Norway, and uh, uh, um, uh, Israel and Serbia. Um, a steering group, which is composed of leading uh, European experts and uh, the PIN project partners, the European Commission and ETSC, um, guarantees scientific rigor to the activities that are undertaken in the framework of the PIN project. And I also would like to um, give a special thank, first and foremost, to the co-chairs of the PIN, Edward Ward and Hank Stiptonk, and to uh, the program advisor, Professor Richard Olsop. And this goes without saying to all my colleagues in the Secretariat who are behind much of the work of the daily work that uh, we are um, carrying out in the framework of the PIN. Dovile, Jenny, Graziella, and all uh, the others. In uh, um, the last 15 years, we have uh, published no less than uh, 40 flash reports, all available online for um, you to download or read, and a countless number of uh, events all around Europe. Now, Let's start with the figures. Let's start with uh, the findings of this 15th PIN annual report. 18,844. The good news, this is almost 11,000 less than 10 years ago. So clearly there has been progress. The very bad news, this is 18,844 too many. It's 51 per day. It's a figure which we continue to consider as unacceptable. 
progress in uh, uh, the number of deaths, as well as in uh, the kilometers driven in uh, uh, the last year, between uh, 2019 and 2020. Well, an unprecedented 17% decrease in the number of road deaths in Europe, but is that meaningful? I mean, in 2019, there were no lockdowns, there was no home working, there was no distant learning. These are things that we need to take into account when uh, looking at the progress made between 2019 and uh, 2020. Um, what is really um, interesting is uh, um, adding in the graph also the um, uh, reductions or the evolution in the exposure data in the numbers of kilometers driven uh, uh, and the change between 2019 and 2020. Um, these are the white histograms. You'll see that uh, uh, out of the various spin countries, only 13 were able to uh, provide these data. And the results are mixed. Uh, what is clear is uh, that because of lockdown, in all the pin countries that could provide data, we have a reduction in the number of kilometers driven. However, in some countries, this was reflected by an increase in uh, the number of deaths. Look, for example, at Switzerland. In some other countries, like Germany, there is uh, a proportional decrease in the number of deaths and the kilometers driven. In other countries, like in Denmark, the reduction in deaths is uh, more than uh, uh, proportional to uh, the decrease in the number of kilometers driven. We don't know what is the uh, real reason behind that. And uh, um, certainly what we can say is that uh, the effects of the lockdown measures of the pandemic, of the crisis, uh, would certainly need to be further researched if we want to learn more about this. A broader horizon now from uh, 2010 to 2020. Everybody is aware that uh, the EU collectively had uh, a target to reach reducing the number of road deaths between 2011 and 2020. A very encouraging start into the decade, six years of good progress, where actually we, uh, um, sorry, three years of good progress, where um, we were almost there, almost on target. And then uh, six years in which uh, the uh, figures have, uh, either stagnated or um, they've been uh, uh, reduced not very uh, significantly. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, year between 2019 and 2020, uh, which we have just uh, mentioned with the uh, um, situation of the um, pandemic, which has certainly um, changed uh, any reference point that we had before. While the EU countries have uh, collectively um, failed to reach the 2020 target, well, all of the PIN countries have uh, made improvements over the last decade and have saved lives by trying to reach the target. Um, we saw the EU average is uh, uh, um, EU27 average reduction has been uh, um, 37 percent. Um, Norway has had in the last decade an impressive 15 percent reduction. And uh, if we only look at the EU countries, well, uh, Greece with 54 percent reduction is the only EU country to have uh, reached the target. The progress was uh, slowest in uh, UK, 14% reduction, and in the Netherlands, with uh, only 5% reduction. Time to look at road mortality, number of deaths per uh, million population. Uh, still, too many differences between uh, uh, the various groups of countries, those in green, dark green, and those in red. And uh, the difference between the various groups is uh, uh, almost uh, fourfold. 
If we look at the detail for uh, uh, the various countries and uh, the evolution of road mortality uh, between 2010 and 2020, well, uh, the EU has uh, um, made a good improvement from uh, um, 68 deaths per million population to uh, 42 in uh, 2020. Um, amongst the PIN countries, Norway remains the leader with uh, 17 deaths per million population, followed by uh, Sweden. Substantial improvements are needed in the countries in red. And uh, uh, let me point out Latvia with uh, uh, 73 deaths per million population and uh, uh, Romania with 85 uh, deaths per million population. We should not forget to also uh, mention the um, number of those uh, um, seriously injured um, according to uh, the new Europeanly agreed definition of MAS 3 plus and uh, um, the number of uh, uh, 120,000 refers to uh, 2019. Collecting data on that, uh, having measures also for serious injuries will be extremely important in the decades to come because we should not forget for uh, the next decade, we have uh, the renewed target to halve the number of road deaths, but also the new target to halve the number of serious injuries between uh, 2020 and 2030. Now, what does the 15 PIN annual report recommend? Um, we have uh, two groups of uh, uh, recommendations, uh, one for countries and one for uh, the European Union. Obviously, uh, the two slides which uh, I'm going to present uh, represent just a summary of uh, the uh, numerous recommendations that uh, we have uh, included in the report. Um, if we start with uh, um, countries, maybe stating the obvious, uh, countries should adopt and should implement the safe system approach. Um, funds. We keep saying, and it is true, that uh, any funds that is spent on uh, road safety is not a cost, it is an investment. It will certainly bring back results. However, funds are needed. Uh, any road safety measure will need sufficient governmental funds. Um, never forget research. Any political choice should be based on evaluation, should be based on sound research results. For those countries that have not yet done so, it is extremely important that they align themselves with the European targets, targets of uh, reducing the number of road deaths and serious injuries in the next decade by um, 50%. And finally, KPIs. We cannot wait until the end of the decade to know whether we are on targets to reach the targets where we are doing them. It's important to also work on uh, um, KPI. We are extremely happy with the move that has been done by the European Commission and the decision agreed by the member states to work also on uh, KPIs. We now encourage member states to start collecting the data for uh, the KPIs which have been agreed to develop new KPIs and what is most important to also set targets for uh, uh, these KPIs. Some recommendations also for uh, the um, uh, European Union. Extremely important to start with the fast uh, implementation of the EU road safety strategy. It's important that uh, we hit the ground running on this. Uh, uh, 10 years go very quickly. So if we are to reach the targets, we really need to uh, be fast on uh, implementing the strategy. A clear assignment of roles, a clear assignment of responsibilities so that we can see who is responsible for what and uh, we can uh, uh, um, take all the necessary measures, measures at all levels to reach the targets. Um, there will be soon uh, new rules on uh, um, driving licenses and an update on uh, the cross-border enforcement directive. 
Of course, this should be as ambitious as possible. Um, we believe it is time that uh, the um, European Union has a recommendation on speed and speed limits on all roads. And very important, a road safety agency. This would be extremely important in helping us in various areas of road safety, not last everything that is related to um, automated and autonomous driving. Now, it's time to move to the announcement of uh, the country that uh, this year has uh, received uh, the PIN award. If you've looked at the press release which just went out, well, you will know this is Greece. Congratulations to Greece. It's a pity we cannot be all in the same room because I'm sure the colleagues from Greece would uh, receive a very loud round of applause. Let's consider this like a virtual round of applause for our colleagues. These are some of the reasons why Greece has uh, received the, 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 the award, why the steering committee decided to award the um, Greece. First and foremost, the very important reduction in the number of road deaths between uh, 2010 and 2020. This is reduction of 54%, only country to reach the target, as opposed to a reduction for the EU of 37%. Of course, not everything is so rosy. You see that mortality in Greece is still above the uh, EU average. So it is important that uh, this uh, award is also seen as an incentive not to be complacent and to continue working on road safety, to continue implementing measures to make sure that the country can become safer and safer. And uh, these are some of the reasons that uh, uh, the steering group could identify for uh, reaching the target. Well, uh, for, uh, sorry, for uh, getting the award, the, the target which has been achieved, the implementation of uh, um, city mobility and safety plan, uh, focusing on infrastructure by several um, Greek uh, municipalities, um, the extension of the uh, motorway network, which is safer by design, and a commitment which uh, uh, we hope will be soon translated into reality uh, in uh, the road safety action plan to adopt um, 30k uh, in uh, Greek urban areas. But it is uh, now time for me to welcome the Deputy Minister for Infrastructure and Transport, Mr. Yannis Kefaloyannis, uh, who I see now uh, next to me on the screen. And I will be delighted to give him the PIN Award for 2021. Congratulations, uh, dear Minister. Uh, I'm sure that you can uh, um, hear all the virtual congratulations and applause from uh, the colleagues who are attending the conference. Uh, but uh, uh, now, uh, without uh, further ado, I'm sure uh, they will all be eager to hear from you. So I'm delighted to give you uh, the floor for uh, a presentation. And uh, just let me uh, inform once again participants that uh, through the Q&A uh, button in the Zoom panel, they can uh, ask questions to the minister. De Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, dear Executive Director Avenozo, Chair uh, European Coordination for uh, Road Safety and Sustainable Mobility, Mr. Baldwin, dear colleague, uh, Mrs. Kudura, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank the European Transport Safety Council for granting us this award to Greece. It is a great honor to us and to and a major accomplishment of utmost importance for two main reasons. First of all, because traffic accidents have always been one of the leading causes of death in Greece, and we are proud to have taken steps towards changing this. And secondly, because this significant reduction in the number of fatalities ties with of the National Strategic Plan for Road Safety, presented a few months ago by Prime Minister Mitsotakis, 
signifying one of the big government priorities. My intention today is not only to talk over what we've done to achieve the highest performance in the European Union over the past decade, I would also like to point out what we have already started in order to further improve road safety in Greece, adopting the Vision Zero approach. It's the first time ever that the country translates its commitment to improve the level of road safety into specific legislative initiatives, administrative actions, and the pipeline of projects. As mentioned before, Greece has marked the highest reduction number of fatalities in the period 2010-2020, and it is the only European country that achieved a reduction by more than 50%, in fact, 54%. Let me highlight the key factors that led to the positive outcome. Much better road network thanks to the construction of new motorways where fatalities are almost zero, such as Aegean Motorway, Andy Platamona section, Corinthos Patras, Antirio Ioannina, Tripoli Kalamata and Lefkos Party, E65, Lida and Vonica bypasses. Important interventions to improve road safety levels, such as Pathé Motorway, this is Athens Lamia section. Northern Greek road access. Newer and safer vehicles reduce traffic road due to the increase in fuel prices and decrease in the available income in the last decade. Reduction of average speed to avoid economic burden. Decreased traffic in 2020 due to COVID-19 outbreak. Nevertheless, we still have a fairly high fatality rate per million population well above the European average based on the latest figures. 54 fatalities per million population compared to 42 in the EU. You already mentioned it. If someone takes a look at the figures, road accidents cost translate into 1.5% of uh, the country's GDP. That is why any financial investment in road safety measures is an investment in human life, which is priceless. No doubt for that. In this context, we adapt our perspective for road safety and we adopt the safe system approach, acknowledging that the human error is inevitable. There are four basic uh, principles for that. People will always make mistakes that lead to road accidents. Take this into account in the design and operation of a road system. When the mistake occurs, the human body has standard limits to absorb the forces of an accident without being injured. Road safety will come through the common responsibility of all parts of a road system and not just the user. All parties involved must work together to ensure that the accident does not result in serious injury of death. The national experience suggests that successful road safety strategy should focus on five components. First of all, reliable and quality data. Governance, strategic plan and targeting, education and coherent communication strategy, effective system of enforcing traffic rules, and safe road uh, network. Good data, quality, save lives. Road safety, public policies should be based on good quality data. Unfortunately, we do not have that, at least to the extent we need it. If we try to break down a car accident in Greece, we understand that the vast majority involve men at the age of 25, 49, who drive mainly a car and move on urban roads. The accidents show seasonality between July and October, while most of the injured are admitted to hospitals in the afternoon and on weekends. But what we do not know about car accidents in Greece is how many and what type of road accidents occurred last summer, for example, in Corfu or Santorini or in Crete Island? What is the reaction time of uh, post crash emergency units per region? Is there a map with the recurrence or accumulation of road accidents in some areas of the country or throughout the country? What percentage of uh, motorcyclists and cyclists wear helmets? To address the above, we're currently working on the establishment 
of the National Observatory for Road Safety. It will be operated by the National Technical University of Athens through a framework contract with the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport. It will be responsible for collecting, processing, and maintaining a national road safety database, and it will publish an annual report on road safety statistics, figures of which will be endorsed by the Hellenic Statistical Authority. In addition, aiming to the collection of key performance indicators, KPIs, for road safety, another contract is to be signed with the National Technical University of Athens for a co-financed project entitled Baseline Project. Second pillar of our strategy, governance, strategic plan, and targeting. An efficient results-focused system of governance is essential for our target to eliminate fatalities. Consider a pyramid structure in the Governmental Road Safety Committee, Executive Committee, regional and local authorities, and of course, civil society. The Governmental Committee, in which I have the honor to be the chair, convened last week with the participation of five deputy ministers and secretaries general. It will coordinate the interministerial work on road safety, approve forecasts, and supervise the implementation of the strategic plan, evaluate the strategic plan results, and if necessary, proceed with its revision. The main working tool will be the National Road Safety Strategic Plan 2021-2030, a study that has already been awarded by the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport. The Executive Committee implements the decision of the Intergovernmental Committee and welcomes proposals from regional and local authorities and civil society. The regional local authorities implement sustainable urban mobility plans in their area of competence, which must include road safety projects in accordance with the law on SUMPs passed by the Greek Parliament in March. Civil society has a crucial role to play. Its actions will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and will be integrated into a coherent plan to serve the main goal of reducing serious injuries and deaths from road accidents pillar of our plan, education and coherent communication strategy. In collaboration with the Ministry of Education, the road safety module was introduced as a pilot course in the skills workshops in 2020-21 in 218 kindergartens, primary and secondary schools. From the academic year 2021-2022 onwards, it will be taught in all school units which is approximately 12,000. At the same time, our ministry drafts new training manuals for the driving license theory exams of candidate drivers as we set a new overall examination procedure. Please also note that in the Ralia, a special educational handbook is provided for the first time for people who have not completed compulsory education, people with learning disabilities, people with hearing problems. We also need to define new minimum requirements for practicing the profession of a driving instructor, such as minimum age for practicing the profession, minimum duration of a possession of the driving license for all categories, new training standards. Furthermore, we need a national communication policy plan for road safety. This will be done through targeted and coherent communication actions, including the media, the content, the period, and the place. Fourth pillar of our strategic plan, effective enforcement system. The Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport has completed the evaluation of the highway code and is proceeding with its revision based on certain principles. Categorization of highway code violations based on the degree of risk and frequency. Separation of sanctions, the basic criterion being the driving behavior or the vehicle condition. Reduction of average speed in urban areas to 30 kilometers per hour. Ensuring enforcement and collection of fines. Introduction of an electronic procedure for monitoring the violations of highway code. 
few more words about the categorization of highway code violations. All violations will be classified based on the associated risk and frequency, while specific fines will be combined with administrative sanctions. Emphasis will be given to the five most frequent violations of highway code, such as speeding, no seatbelt use, no helmet use, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, mobile phone use. In cooperation with the Ministry of Citizen Protection, we will also set priorities for the frequency of checks and their geographical distribution. Enforcement of fines also depends on the vehicle condition and the driving behavior. We need more safe vehicles and we have already established a register of vehicle technical inspectors comprising private engineers to carry out an on-the-spot re-inspection at the vehicle inspector inspection center. What is more, we have decided to reduce average speed in urban areas to 30 kilometers per hour. And you may ask why. So let's see. Increasing the speed of a vehicle by 5% leads to the increase in road accidents by 10% and fatal accidents by 20%. When a car is moving at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour, the probability of a fatal injury for a pedestrian is 10%. If the same car is moving at 50 kilometers per hour, the probability of the same fatal injury to the pedestrian rises to 80%. So at 50 kilometers per hour, the collision with the pedestrian can prove to be 80% deadly. On top of that, we proceed with the digital verification and registration of highway code violations to increase the revenues of local authorities that will be then channeled to road safety road projects. In addition, road safe road behavior of uh, repeating offenders is planned to be also digitally managed. The message to be sent is that impunity is not part of the game anymore. Fifth pillar, safe road network. The Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport is running an extensive road safety interventions program including 7,000 hazardous locations in 2,500 kilometers, 80 road axes, 60 studies in all 13 regions of Greece, a loan agreement of uh, 450 million with Egnatia Odos SA with the support of the European Investment Bank. Our existing road network is constantly being improved by constructing new, modern and safe motorways such as Patra Pyrgos, E65, the North Park, VOAC, extensions of Atiki Odos, flyover in Thessaloniki. Dear country, the road safety contract is based on safe roads, responsible drivers, traffic education, and fair rules for everyone. The price is not the end of our efforts, but a starting point to save more lives to achieve the goal of reducing the number of fatalities and seriously injured by an additional 50% in 2030 and to reach zero fatalities in 2050. This is our vision zero. The goal may seem difficult to accomplish, but I guess we all agree it is worth trying. Dedicated work and comprehensive plans can only add to better road safety performance. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, dear um, Deputy uh, Minister. Very interesting presentation. We have uh, a, a few questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one actually is mine, while we collect the ones that are coming from, uh, um, from the audience. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned, and that's uh, um, extremely interesting, the setting up of a national road safety um, observatory, um, which is great, um, great news. But uh, my question is, how will you make sure that the data, the recommendations of uh, uh, the observatory are uh, implemented are put into practice afterwards. And that, thank, thank you for, uh, for the question. Uh, the idea behind that is that it's not merely set up the National Observatory for Road Safety. What is more important uh, is that uh, uh, we have decided to establish it by law. The data, the conclusions, and any proposals uh, of the observatory will be assessed by the Intergovernmental Committee as part of its agenda, 
So in this context, uh, uh, the goal is to formalize our goals for road safety on an hourly basis. And we believe that uh, by this uh, way, uh, the, all this uh, uh, idea behind uh, National Observatory for Road Safety will be taken into account in decision making. Thank you. Um, there is a question uh, uh, from a colleague that is linked to uh, the point, the very interesting point you made on enforcement and uh, uh, to ending up the sense of uh, um, impunity. Um, it's uh, a specific one on uh, enforcement of uh, uh, motorcycle helmets. Um, it is felt that uh, uh, um, Greece should step up the enforcement of uh, uh, motorcycle helmet use, especially when it comes to uh, heavier motorbikes. In fact, it's, it's our will to move forward with uh, all the enforcement of uh, the highway code. And of course, we will include such uh, provisions. As uh, I referred to you previously, uh, we are under examination of the current uh, highway code. And of course, we will take into account and into consideration all these uh, provisions. So I, again, I will want to restate uh, our uh, uh, willingness to move forward in order to have uh, fair rules for all. And uh, when we mean fair rules for all, this, is, this means for the users of uh, the highways, uh, the pedestrians, and of course, uh, all uh, people who uh, are in uh, mobility. Yeah. Well, thanks. You, uh, you actually, your, your answer also links to uh, the next question, which uh, um, I have received, uh, because it talks about vulnerable road users, uh, how to lower the risk posed to uh, vulnerable road users by um, heavy goods vehicles, especially in, uh, uh, especially in cities? As I, as I referred before, I mean, uh, Greece intends to reduce uh, uh, 30 kilometers per hour speed limits in, in uh, zones in uh, the cities. And uh, as uh, I told you before, uh, we have uh, followed LD's guidelines in uh, the legislation, for example, for sustainable urban mobility plans. And of course, uh, these uh, mobility plans uh, will be uh, mandatory for towns and cities that have uh, more than 30,000 uh, uh, people. And uh, all sustainable mobility plans must provide for road safety projects. And of course, uh, part of uh, these projects will be reducing the speed limit to 30 kilometers per hour. And I think this, is, uh, this will be a very good point in order to protect the uh, most uh, vulnerable uh, people and especially pedestrians. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question also from uh, uh, a colleague from, uh, from Greece, uh, uh, Vasiliki Danelli Milona, and uh, uh, she's asking about the role of uh, um, civil society in uh, implementing the strategy. What is, uh, uh, in your opinion, the role of civil society in uh, making sure that uh, uh, progress is made? As I referred previously, we want all actors responsible for road safety to be together and uh, to ensure that uh, they were all working towards the same goal. What we've seen is that uh, the lack of a central governance system led to the need to establish, first of all, the Intergovernmental Committee on Road Safety, which is a permanent body responsible for monitoring the implementation of actions and projects. But apart from that, as I previously referred to the pyramid shape of uh, governance, that includes not only the governmental committee, but also the executive committee, the local and regional authorities, and of course, civil society, all constituting an undivided uh, system of uh, synergies. And of course, civil society has a very crucial role to play. Okay, we almost there. I have another one which I cannot uh, uh, not ask. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. You mentioned investments, you mentioned funding. And uh, um, how will Greece do to dedicate funding and direct income to road safety? Because here they insist that uh, road safety is uh, a, an investment rather than a cost. Well, frankly speaking, uh, resources has never been a problem for road safety uh, in Greece. Just to give you an idea, we have already an approved by the European Commission Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility Program. It was approved yesterday for Greece that includes also provisions uh, for road safety funds. There, there are also EU funds uh, uh, on the table. And of course, revenues from fines coming from uh, violations of the highway code. Uh, to the contrary, 
The actual problem has been the lack of a coherent and uh, comprehensive plan comprising uh, clear cut actions and of course, the lack of uh, a standing committee to coordinate this work. And this is the gap that we intend to bridge. Well, thank you very much, dear Minister. Before I let you go, we've been greeting you with our questions, but uh, uh, maybe you have uh, another message, something that you want to say to other countries after having reached the uh, uh, prestigious PIN uh, award. Any recommendation on uh, uh, um, how to get that? In fact, uh, as I uh, referred to my speech, uh, although the goal may be uh, tropical, we need to enforce uh, uh, our efforts uh, to, Im to improve our efforts in order to achieve this goal. And we believe that uh, uh, this goal uh, will be come, um, come out of a uh, very hard work of all uh, stakeholders, not only in a national level, but also in a European level. And I think this is uh, maybe the, the best way to achieve uh, this uh, great goal. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, can you please take the award again so that we can have a picture for uh, uh, the records? Of course. There you go. When my colleagues are ready. Fantastic. Well, Deputy Minister, congratulations again. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we uh, wish you all the very best in uh, continuing the hard work in uh, uh, road safety and uh, um, saving human lives. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you. Now, we are ready to move on. And uh, I'm delighted to invite to uh, speak uh, Matthew Baldwin. Does he really need an introduction? No, he does not. Uh, but uh, uh, he is uh, a Deputy Director General at the European Commission as the European Coordinator for uh, uh, Road Safety and Sustainable Mobility. Matthew, the floor is yours. We will learn more about road safety actions by the European Commission. Carlo Antonio, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be with you again, to be able to speak at another PIN uh, award conference and an award ceremony, and to be with our great friends and partners in road safety at the European Transport Safety Council. Antonio and team, thank you for everything you do. I have to say how absolutely delighted I am for Greece. All my congratulations to you, Deputy Minister, on this very, very worthy award. To Manus Parisis, uh, to all the other, the, the team in Athens, all the stakeholders, our great friend Georgianis at the NTU, you must be very proud today and justly so, and I just wish we could be celebrating together. I mean, Greece, you have done an amazing job in, in achieving the EU targets. I'm sad that you're the only country in the EU which has managed to meet the EU target uh, for, for, for 2020. But I'm also, I, I'd like to echo what Antonio said about the leadership and the spirit you've, you've shown working with all sectors and partners, and most of all, by the fact that you're not satisfied by the progress you've made and you are determined to do further. It's so clear to me from what you've just said that Greece wants more road safety and we want you to have it and we want to work you with you in getting there. Otherwise, Antonio, and this I think will be my only downbeat moment, I just want to share your disappointment on the statistics. Uh, the statistics continue to smack us between the eyes when I stop to think about them. It's amazing. Every time I see them and hear them, uh, we just need to repeat the numbers, 19,000 deaths in the European Union, um, uh, a 36 percent drop since uh, 2010, but well below. Let's be let's be honest. Let's face it. Well below the 50 percent we targeted, a drop of 17 percent in 2020. But we should be clear about the COVID impact of that. It should indeed have been a bigger drop in 2020 if we take account of traffic volumes. Again, Greece is the only country that achieved the targets since 2010. And, and if you review the figures, and I'm not pointing fingers or blaming anyone, I'm sharing the pain. I mean, the, not the normal leaders are doing less well. We still have a few countries suffering greatly. Again, no blame game. It's just simply awful to see Romania up there still at more than 80 deaths per million at nearly twice the European average. We have to do better collectively, and we must. And indeed, this is the sort of underlying theme for what I want to talk about today, why we need to restore the momentum to our work, why we need, if you like, to get road safety back up on the horse. Um, and here I am actually very optimistic. 
I want to briefly review what we've been doing in the EU, where we're going in the EU, and finally I'd like to say a quick word about the global picture. Um, one should never look too far back, but I want to remind you of our road safety strategy that we adopted in 2018 and our subsequent policy framework in 2019, because that really sets out what we're now trying to achieve. And actually, when I look at it, um, I'm starting to feel a little bit proud about the way we're moving forward. Not proud about the results yet, but proud about what we're achieving along the way. The safe system approach, you just said it beautifully explained by the Greek uh, deputy minister, so I won't go into that. But that implies actions where we can at European level on areas such as vehicle safety, such as infrastructure, such as on speed, and I'll say more about those in a moment. It implies a strong approach to targets and performance tracking. And here we are moving ahead with key performance indicators at the European level, um, agreed by all member states. And now uh, we are rolling ahead in 10 years areas. We're going live with the data collection this year. We're proud to be supporting that financially at the European level. The third element, which is crucial, I'll, I'll keep coming back to this, the notion of shared responsibility and partnership in all areas between all actors at all levels with the member states. Let's go back all the way to 2017 and the Valletta Declaration. That's where the member states stood up to be counted. We knew we were struggling with the numbers, but the member states said they wanted more road safety. And that is frankly still the driving force behind what we're doing now. We have a increasingly vibrant high level group in, in, of road safety officials, which it is my honor to chair in the European Union. Um, and uh, we are starting now to use that group to disseminate uh, uh, quickly where it's necessary strategic advice. For example, on road safety in the COVID crisis, we put out uh, some well-received guidelines uh, for member states to follow. Not just from the member states, from the parliament. You're gonna hear in a moment from Elena Contura, uh, and I'll let her set out her, her own initiative report, but the parliament is standing up to be counted as well. From cities and regions across Europe, um, they're putting road safety back on the map. Um, from, the, um, uh, from our relaunched European road safety uh, charter, um, which is, I'm proud to say, the biggest civil society platform in the world on road safety. And since our relaunch, it's getting bigger and brighter. And if you're not already a member of the European road safety charter, please join up. It's a fantastic potential exchange uh, platform from the European Road Safety Observatory, which we've relaunched and revamping. So this is putting our, uh, our studies, our, da our data out there in a much richer form. And last but not least, the Road Safety Exchange, um, funded by the Parliament, uh, implemented by the Commission and the European Transport Safety Council. Delighted that Greece is participating as such an active member of that. And I'm very much hope we can go further and faster with the, with the European uh, uh, Road Safety Exchange project. And thank you all, everyone, the ET, ETSC, for all your efforts uh, to take that forward. Funding, you know, where we can make a difference, we will make a difference at the European level through regional funds, through the Connecting Europe facility, through the Safer tra Transport platform we worked on with the European Investment Bank. And um, as you've just mentioned, Antonio, through the Recovery and Resilience Fund, I hope member states will be dedicating money to road safety in all contexts, on their national networks, in rural networks, and also, last but not least, at the urban level. If we're honest, we need to do more. Uh, we will do more. I'd like to see more voluntary commitments coming forward from different stakeholders, um, uh, especially on some of the new road safety issues, which I'll say more about in a moment. Um, and we are going to constantly check how we're doing at the European level. Uh, we are. Uh, we held our first um, European Union Road Safety Results Conference in April. Thank you, Antonio, for participating uh, in that and, uh, and Mrs. Contora. And we will do so in future on a regular basis. We will be accountable for this strategy. So how are we doing specifically and what things are we going to be doing in the future? Let me say a brief word about legislation. Um, where we have competence, we are not afraid to exercise it. But we should not legislate just where we can, but where we must and because we must. Um, uh, we need to think about these issues also in combination. Let me give you just two examples of that. The uh, vehicle safety. Um, I, I will anticipate, I'm sure, the discussion of the panel a little bit here, but the general safety regulation was safely revised in 2019. But the crucial work of implementation goes on. Uh, a major landmark was reached just the other day with the agreed implementing regulation by member states for ISA. Um, 
To take the death saving as a whole from the general safety regulation, we are looking at a saving of 7,000 or so deaths by 2030, 25,000 deaths by 2037, more than an annual, uh, an annual, uh, um, um, uh, um, more than an annual saving in, in road safety deaths across the European Union. Um, and I think it's important to remind ourselves that the work on vehicle safety is not yet done. We are in the process of moving out from our historic success, and we're very proud of it, in protecting occupants inside cars to those outside the cars and the vulnerable road users, and more on that in a moment. Infrastructure. We've updated our road infrastructure safety management directive, and there's lots of work going on now to implement that again. Think of the issues in combination. It's essential that we have better road signs and markings for ISA to function successfully. If we get the road infrastructure safety management directive right, and we're committed to doing so, another 3,000 lives saved on conservative predictions in our, uh, in our modeling by 2030. So there will be further legislation coming down the track, as you saw in our sustainable and smart mobility strategy, uh, safety found a prominent place. Um, there will be, uh, uh, um, there is a commitment there to come forward with revisions to the driving license directive, which we haven't revised since 2006. We need to address the administrative burdens of the system. We need to get ready for new technology and digitalization. And last but not least, we need to ensure that it's fit for purpose on road safety. It's a vital tool in our road safety armory. The cross-border enforcement directive has been around for a while. We're looking at ways in which we can reinforce the deterrent effect of road traffic sanctions across our EU borders and enable improved enforcement. There will be revisions to our roadworthiness directive, and we'll also be considering the need for an agency to support the safe, smart, and sustainable uh, road transport that we need for the future. So much for classical legislation, but there's so much more that we can do as a European Union. And I think our new approach in road safety under our strategy, again, our partnership approach enables us to do more. And this, I think, is going to be uh, crucial in the future if we look at and if we're going to succeed in tackling some of the new issues and trends, including those that lie outside our classical competence. Antonio, you mentioned speed. This is not an issue of EU competence. This is for member states and sometimes regions and cities to set their speed limit. But it is another issue we are considering carefully internally. Uh, and as you say, whether we should adopt guidelines, e.g. a recommendation for the future. It's clearly going up the agenda and we're consciously working on that. We had a very successful speed seminar with strong recommendations on the Commission for Action along the lines you, you've just mentioned. But we also see a number of member states and regions and, and cities taking action themselves on motorways such as in the Netherlands, on the rural roads such as in France, on urban roads. We just heard from Greece with the 30k in cities throughout Europe with, if I may say, very good results, which are indeed predicted by the ETSC. It's not just about speed limits, of course, it's also about enforcement. And again, we will be looking at this. I can only confirm at this stage we're looking hard at it, but we hear loud and clear the message from the ETSC and elsewhere. Similarly, on other um, safe road use issues, such as alcohol and drugs and distraction, these are clearly important questions. And once again, where we can use our partnership approach to work with the member states, with the parliament, with road safety advocates, with the industry to do more to address these major killers. But our road safety partnership approach is also serving us well in starting to address some of the broader societal issues with which road safety uh, interacts so naturally. Antonio, if I may, I think for too long, we've allowed road safety to stay in a box marked technical issues, the sole province of uh, uh, road traffic engineers. The safe system visionary, vision zero approach, which indeed is visionary, requires us to get out of that box. It requires us to build partnerships in new areas, such as in sustainability and climate change. There is no sustainability without safety. If you look at the external costs, just within cities of air pollution, of congestion, of noise, um, we can tackle those issues together with road safety. If we look at urban issues again in a, in a, in a, broader, in a broader package, we increasingly we're becoming an urban society. 70% of us will live in towns by 2050, and 70% of the current fatalities in towns are to vulnerable road users, to, to active mobility users, 
who are driving massive health benefits by their daily commutes, by their choice of transport, and we need to support them, we need to make them safe. Through the platform economy, again, I'm sure you'll be talking about this in the panel, the rise and rise of e-commerce, of delivery vans, we need to think about the safety of the drivers, but also the road users they're interacting with. And last but not least, we need to think about how we're going to tackle the increasingly autonomous and connected vehicles of the future and bring those within a European road safety framework. A lot of work, in short, lies ahead. I said I'd be just touching briefly on the global uh, angle, and I, and I would like to do so. Um, uh, as you know, in the European Union, we take our global responsibilities seriously. In, uh, we will continue to do so on road safety. We're focusing our work a lot on Africa, but also on the Eastern Partnership countries and the Western Balkans. And if there's one theme we're very pleased to be and proud to be tackling, it is the theme of road safety observatories. Uh, we're not alone in that. We're working in partnership with a lot of other players. Um, but we think we can move forward and take these basic important steps as part of our contribution to the global agenda. Um, the second point I'd just like to mention is, and I'm proud to be uh, the chair of its advisory board, is the UN Road Safety Fund. Um, uh, we're starting to make a real difference with the fund, and I'm proud to be part of it. But I do urge all of, uh, if I may, for one moment, take that, put that hat on. We need more funds for the for the UN Road Safety Fund. Uh, we face a, a, a funding crisis, and our ability to get out there and back important projects within the UN system and elsewhere, and and to send a strong message that we have at the core of the United Nations systems a strong fund risks being challenged if we don't get stronger contributions. And this global picture is essential. Well, before the COVID uh, breakdown, we just managed to have the Stockholm conference and a very successful conference at well with a powerful declaration. Even during COVID, we managed to drive forward with a UN General Assembly resolution, uh, uh, which I think was a remarkable achievement uh, uh, at, at that time. And there will be a leaders meeting in 2022. Um, the, you, the, the, the global agenda for road safety is certainly regathering its momentum and that global plan of action, which a number of us are working on, has to be a powerful operational document for, US, uh, for, for road safety uh, administrations across the world to take forward the safe system and to implement it. We know it can be done. And, and this is my final point in a way that the, the safe system is not a rich country privilege. The, the safe system has the most application for the poorer countries of the global south, and we must help them uh, implement it. Antonio, that's where I really should stop and where I want to conclude. We started talking about the European numbers, and again, we share your disappointment uh, on the figures for the last decade. All of us in the system, including in the European Commission, need to put our hands up to take responsibility for this failure and to use this disappointment to drive our energy to do better in this next decade. Globally, again, that's even more important. We have 1.3 million deaths at the global level. That, in the true sense of the word, is unacceptable. But the last global theme I want to touch on, and this is why I'm supremely optimistic, if you could just tap in for a few moments in the month of May to the energy and the determination we saw during the UN Global Road Safety Week around the theme of uh, safe streets and then the theme of promoting 30 kilometer speed limits across the world. It was fantastic in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, as well as in Europe and North America. We saw that commitment to change. Um, I believe fundamentally that shows that road safety can and should be treated as the priority issue at local, national, European and global level that it deserves. We will continue to tackle uh, it is a priority with our partners in the ETSC. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That's a, a usually inspiring, committed speech, and uh, uh, we are very grateful for that. Um, so grateful that I, I will start with a very tough question that I got from, uh, <laughs> from the audience. But I mean, I know you are up to it, so you, you don't <laughs> mind tough questions. Uh, right. Uh, uh, that refers actually to the point you were making on uh, uh, the um, uh, um, uh, own initiative report. We'll hear soon from MEP Contour about mm. that. And uh, uh, the question is, is the European Parliament the main institution and the main motivator asking for uh, uh, improved road safety in the EU? Oof, good luck. Well, I mean, 
maybe to surprise you, I, you know, we don't we don't insist on being the leaders of this thing. We're delighted to see the leadership coming from the European Parliament. Um, we're delighted to see the leadership coming from from member states, from from regions, from cities. It's a partnership, um, and um, no, I mean um, we're not we're not insisting. I mean, in, in a sense, once you move away from a classical approach just based on competence, where, if you, as you know, the Commission has the the sole right of initiative, you're desperate for others to take up the baton. You're desperate to find partners who can work together. And again, I don't want to steal Mrs. Contura's thunder here. She will be setting out herself what's in the report, which of course is not yet final. But we are we're very excited by the ambitions that they have, and I think. The European Commission needs that helpful pressure from players like the Parliament and indeed from the ETSC and, and the member states and, and, and everyone in the system to push harder and to go further. So um, I'm not a, in the slightest offended by your question, Antonio, and uh, uh, we're very, very happy to, to be working with the Parliament on these issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, another question. Um, urban populations are growing. Um, possibly we will see more individual transport on our urban roads in post-COVID times and a dangerous mix, possibly more cars, more cyclists and pedestrians and e-mobility users. Shouldn't the European Commission be doing more to transform the landscape of urban mobility? What can the EC do to support 30 kilometers an hour city in cities? So it's a very long one and there are uh, uh, several points. So if I can sum up, uh, well, uh, how can you work as the European Commission to transform the urban mobility landscape, taking into account the dangerous mix, as the author calls it, and what can you do to support 30K in urban areas? Well, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, first of all, uh, we have to be honest, it is a dangerous mix. Um, if, uh, um, if we have more cars, um, and at the same time, as you heard me said, you know, we are encouraging more active mobility. If we can't find a way of creating better infrastructure and safer infrastructure, which makes the cyclists and the pedestrians safer, we will have more road deaths. It's, it's as simple as that. And when I look at the traffic numbers, um, uh, they are coming back up. I think I saw from the UK that they're now uh, that actually higher um, car use than before the epidemic. And we know we've seen a collapse I hope a temporary collapse in the use of, of public transport. So it's the right question. We've got to look at it. Um, and uh, the only thing that's truly unacceptable is that particularly in this era of COVID with stretched emergency services, we have more deaths and, and serious injuries. So the, the question is absolutely right. What more can we do? Well, uh, I can give you um, a sneak preview that we'll be coming forward with a revised urban mobility framework later this year. And that, of course, goes more broadly than road safety. But if we get that right, we will also be improving safety as one of the key factors there. Again, it's one of those areas where we don't have full competence, it, 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 to put it mildly. It's, uh, it's, uh, we have not done much legislation on urban road safety. But again, if we can develop that partnership approach, I think there are things that we could do. Um, we can we can put more into our sustainable urban mobility plans. We can do more to gather data back to the KPIs point through sustainable urban mobility indicators. We can do more to look at the last mile and uh, uh, and the first mile and and to try to make that safe as well. So again, no sustainability without safety. When we're looking at that at the urban framework, we've got to bring uh, safety into it. I hear your point about the 30 kilometer uh, um, uh, an hour uh, campaign. Again, it was a a hugely successful campaign in the UN Global Road Safety Week. I should stress it really is for cities and sometimes for countries to decide. But as I've said earlier, we are looking at guidance or a recommendation to sort of set out and encourage uh, member states to set uh, different uh, speed limits for different types of roads and enforce them. Um, and uh, very much urban uh, roads uh, would be part of that package if we if we can move forward with that. So I hope that answers your question. Well, it's a good question. Asked, and actually, uh, well, you've triggered the, the next question that came immediately after you started speaking about that. And uh, uh, you, you would expect the subsidiarity question arriving. Uh, are you not stepping too much beyond EU competences? Um, well, if we, if we do that, we won't succeed. Um, and, and so, I mean, what by which I mean, if we if we try to legislate in areas where we don't have competence, all we ensure then is a pointless and bloody fight with uh, member states, and uh, we won't uh, we won't succeed. Um, 
I mean, competence is, is not always uh, um, a given. I mean, for example, we have managed to advance, I think, on infrastructure, the Road Infrastructure Safety Management Directive. We're now tackling more roads than at the start. And it's partly a question of what becomes acceptable, what is deemed acceptable by, by, by member states. But I, and I tried to stress in, in, in my remarks, Antonio, we, we think we can do more going beyond legislation by working together with, uh, with, uh, with member states and the parliament and others, and not just in a legislative framework or in a binding legislative framework. Let me take one example, the recommendation on blood alcohol limits, which has been around for a while. Um, you know, there are a lot of people saying, what's the EU doing sticking its nose into that? That's for member states to decide. And it is. But with that recommendation, which sets out the core central value of 0.5 milligrams per milliliter, and yes, I know the ETSC would like us to go further, all 27 member states are now following that core recommendation. I'm not saying they do so, they're doing so because of the recommendation, but I think it was part of the helpful process by which you can use peer pressure and saying, well, that's the recommendation, maybe we should do it. And that's the, the spirit, not just with recommendations, but using peer pressure, using discussion, sharing information, sharing ideas, bringing in uh, other stakeholders that we can make road safety, this true safe system uh, vehicle uh, of, of shared collective responsibility to get forward. That sounds waffly, but I'm seeing it happen in practice and it's very exciting. Very good. Uh, I promise it's probably the last or the second last. Uh, how is the EC progressing on uh, DG cross-sectoral cooperation, like the example of DG employment and platform work? Well, great example. I mean, I should have given them the credit when I mentioned it. But the general safety regulation is the work of DG Grow, and I want to pay a huge tribute to them. And if it's, it's invidious to single individual, but Peter Brocher has done enormous work to drive the implementation of the general safety regulation forward. We work very closely with them. Um, and you mentioned the platform um, uh, uh, issue. We had a, a great colleague from DG Employment come to our last high level group meeting to explain what they're looking at in terms of the, the broader issues around platform workers, the social issues. And they're very open and let's see, I, I, I can't make commitments at this stage to see where we can plug in some of those road safety aspects. We work hand in glove with our partners. We all have to learn to call them a different thing now. DG INTPA used to be DG DEVCO, the, the guys doing uh, uh, development assistance with, uh, with uh, um, uh, the, the Global South. And they are being immensely helpful in bringing road safety up the agenda. I'm hoping that we will have um, a stronger contribution from that source coming for the, from the European Union for the UN Road Safety Fund. I mean, I could go on. Um, I'm trying not to make it uh, with my hat of road safety coordinator on too heavy a process and kind of gathering people together for pointless meetings. We have very rich um, discussions on lots of issues with lots of players across the European Union. And I want to thank all the commissioners and DGs involved for helping us bring road safety towards the top of the political priorities. Thank you, Matthew. I mean, I would have still like six, seven questions to ask, but I will not because... Uh, I've talked too much. You've heard quite <laughs> enough. <laughs> but I, can I ask you a last... I mean, you are such a leader in road safety. Can I ask you a last word to motivate all the participants to this conference on how we can bring up higher the uh, road safety issue on the political agenda? Well, it's kind of you. I don't feel like a leader. I think that the job of a coordinator is someone who's trying to encourage um, leadership from others, <laughs> and um, and I think we see that uh, from 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 you and ETSC and others. And I mean, it, it gives me a, a platform, if you like, to speak out about it. Um, I'm just genuinely pleased at the enthusiasm I get. Um, I, I used to say, as I go across Europe, I don't go across Europe, and I just to speak to webinars across Europe about the reality of of, of road safety and how how important we can make it for people's lives and how well it fits in with the other changes people are trying to bring to their lives post COVID. And I think as you mentioned it yourself, um, and Antonio, or was, or was it in the ETSC press release, the COVID period, how ho however horrible it's been, has seen unprecedented public action to step in and save lives. And if we look at the numbers, in orders of magnitude, we're losing the same order of magnitude to people on our roads globally as we're losing to the COVID epidemic. And we're taking unprecedented public action. I just, we, we could have a little bit of that magic secret source and have governments across the world working with all stakeholders to deliver road safety. It's, it's, a, it's a passion we share, Antonio. 
Um, but I do believe we're starting to get there. Thanks for the chance to speak to you today. Thank you very, very much, Matthew. And I'm sure the participants will join me in thanking you and applauding you for all what you're doing and for all your nice uh, words and uh, uh, inspiring speech. Uh, we are now ready to move uh, uh, and give the floor to MEP Elena Contura, uh, who is the rapporteur on the EP Own Initiative Report on Road Safety. Mrs. Contura is also Greek. I mean, it happens. It's not, uh, uh, she's not been invited because uh, the, uh, uh, her country got the award, but uh, uh, we are- It's a conspiracy, Antonio. It's a Greek it's a conspiracy. conspiracy. It's a conspiracy, indeed. Uh, I, I will really need to start learning Greek as well. Uh, Mrs. Contura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, dear minister, dear executive director, dear Matthew Baldwin, dear ladies and gentlemen, my friends. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to participate at this uh, year's PIN conference, not only because I have been working very uh, intensely as uh, the European Parliament's Rapporteur on Road Safety, but also because my country, Greece, <laughs> is this year's winner and for good reasons. I had the honor to serve as Minister of Tourism of, uh, of Greece for 2015 to 2019, and I know firsthand the enormous efforts that the Greek government at that time made to enhance the safety and invest in the quality of the Greek road uh, network. Road safety has since uh, then become a top priority in the national agenda. We pushed hard to improve road uh, infrastructure and manage to complete the country's core network. Between 2014 and 2018, about 85% of infrastructure completed in Greece were uh, highway projects uh, co-financed by the uh, EU. Old and dangerous motorways were replaced by modern, safer infrastructure, reducing significantly the uh, risk of crisis. And at the same time, important reforms were put uh, forward. For example, uh, the revision of the Greek Highway Code in 2018 introduced a new scheme for traffic uh, violation based on the severity, <coughs> I'm sorry, of the infraction. The new bill we introduced set stiffer penalties for the most frequent uh, violations and imposed the fines to uh, offenders according to uh, income criteria. Of course, a lot still needs to be done because as for the whole of Europe, road uh, fatalities remain high. I'm pleased that Greece has today a new national strategy for road safety 2021 to 2030. And the Greek Minister for Transport referred to the plan uh, extensively. It's a good basis for progress in the next uh, decade and shares many priorities with our own report in the European Parliament. It is now imperative that the strategy uh, is implemented uh, swiftly and adjusted where necessary so that Greece remains a champion in road safety. I want to be very clear. We know the factors and causes behind fatal road accidents. And we also know uh, how we can reduce deaths and injuries. What really matters in road safety is strong political will. And strong political will must be translated into bold action. We have to keep uh, the pressure on the national governments and the European Commission to do what it takes to achieve uh, the renewed 2030 target and move uh, decisively uh, towards vision zero. Ladies and gentlemen, before saying a couple of words on the report, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the European Transport Safety Council for its great efforts to bring about real progress in road safety. Part of today's award to Greece is thanks to your own work in the context of the EU road safety change whose aim is to share best practices. Greece 
has participated since 2019 and the new national strategy has been greatly influenced by your expertise. Together with my colleagues in Tran from most political groups, we have proposed the continuation and expansion of this program so that more countries can benefit. I hope that the Commission will agree with us and will accept to implement uh, the continuation of this program. Let me now turn to the Parliament's report on road safety, which I'm happy to say will be voted today and tomorrow in Tran Committee, uh, simply uh, with a vast uh, majority, since all political groups have supported our compromise amendments. Following the structure of the safe system approach, the report includes very specific recommendations for uh, enhancing safety in infrastructure, vehicles, and the use of roads. And as a general remark, our focus has been on vulnerable road uh, users who have not benefited from recent progress on road safety as much as car drivers and car passengers. First and foremost, we welcome the work uh, of the Commission on the safe system approach. It is indeed the backbone of our efforts to achieve our uh, renewed uh, target to reduce deaths and serious injuries by 50% in 2030. The commitment of the coordinator, Mr. Baldwin, and the work of relevant units allow us to be hopeful uh, for uh, the future. The Commission's work on the K performance indicator is critical. It will allow member states to start collecting reliable data and consequently to set uh, benchmarks and outcome targets and measures progress. For me, this is also a tool of democratic accountability of governments since the citizens and uh, civil society will have objective criteria to assess the effectiveness of the administration and elected politicians. We believe that the current set of KPIs can benefit from the addition of a set of new indicators such as a KPI for driver fatigue, in commercial transport or a KPI for road infrastructure, which uh, would indicate the safety quality of a road network. On a safe infrastructure, most European roads must be systematically assessed and rated basis on commonly agreed criteria, including infrastructure in urban areas, which must be safe for vulnerable road users. Investments should be facilitated by European funds, including the RRF, and realized as priority where there is uh, the highest life-saving potential. On safe vehicles, we want advanced safety systems that really work such as an ambitious intelligence speed assistance. We are even looking into the future and are asking for the next generation ISAs that would go even further than uh, current systems. We ask for a type approval framework for new pro uh, personal mobility devices and European guidelines on traffic rules and generally on their use. We also stress the need for a new harmonized regulatory framework for automated cars in order to safeguard that they will operate in a safe manner. On safe road use, which I would say is the focus of our recommendations, we propose that safe speed limits must apply for all different road types. An obvious example is the maximum speed of 30 kilometers in urban areas. On this issue, we expect a new guidance from the Commission, which is uh, long overdue, as many cities are already moving forward. There is really no excuse on further delay, as it will not be legally binding, but still it will show leadership and facilitated uptake by the ones that they want to do the right thing. A clear stance must be taken in favor of uh, zero tolerance, drink and drunk driving for all drivers. Also, we must uh, strengthen the efficiency of the existing framework for cross-border 
enforcement of road traffic offenses, introduce measures to tackle commercial drivers fatigue and improve the safety of delivery drivers, enhance collaboration between road safety authorities and the health sector, and ensure proper enforcement of road traffic rules as an essential element for safer road use. I would like to stress two specific key proposals of uh, our report. First, using less cars means reducing the risk of crests. It is also good for the environment and for our health. Our report uh, expl um, explicitly mentioned that uh, transport infrastructure in urban areas must be reprioritized away from individual motorized transport towards public transport and other sustainable, safer and healthier transport modes such as walking and cycling. Second, the European Parliament will call for the setting up of a new agency on road transport to support sustainable, safe and smart road transport. An active and leading role at the European level is a prerequisite in closing the road safety gap, not by taking competences away from member states, but on the contrary, by empowering member states to effectively implement the safe system approach. The EU road safety change program is a very good example of the need for stronger European action. But uh, probably the best argument in support of strong European action in the field of road safety is the fact that such actions in the field of aviation, maritime and railways has been a great success. I'm concerned that the safe system approach and our targets for 2030 will remain wishful thinking unless the European Commission takes brave action and propose the setting up of a new agency for road transport as soon as possible. The European Parliament will be ready to support. Ladies and gentlemen, we often hear about the substantial progress on road safety in the previous decade, not only in Greece, but throughout Europe. However, the truth is that the numbers are still shocking. They represent next door tragedies and highlight it in the most dramatic way that road safety must be a priority at a political, social and personal level. We cannot feel safe. Our families and loved ones are not safe until everyone is safe. And this is the essence of the vision zero that we all share. To this end, I'm looking forward to continue our close cooperation and to make sure our proposals will be taken on board by the Commission and the Member States. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, dear MEP. I see uh, Matthew that is uh, applauding you and the same goes for me and for all your work that uh, um, you've done on uh, um, the own initiative report. If I may, I know we are uh, quickly approaching the 11.30 uh, hour that, that when we need to uh, stop for a break. Uh, but maybe I have one question for you. And uh, you mentioned in uh, your speech, uh, um, your role as former Minister of Tourism and uh, uh, the work um, you've done uh, with the uh, infrastructure minister in uh, uh, Greece on uh, uh, road safety uh, initiatives. Uh, of course, uh, we are all aware of the stagnation in uh, the EU in the last part of the decade. So um, what would be... Uh, as, as, a, as an MEP, your top request to the EC and to the member state governments to, uh, to do something differently for uh, uh, um, reaching the next uh, target in 2030? Well, uh, I would like to see the new European Agency for Road Transport taking the lead to implement the proposals that we have included on in our report and specifically for safe uh, cities with a focus on vulnerable road users and safe vehicles using ambitious technologies. There are wide uh, disparities among member states and I believe that member states need the support at the European level and need the pressure so they collect data and implement uh, the right policies for the benefits of road users. 
Well, thank you very, very much. And uh, uh, let me also thank you because we know it's a busy time in the parliament with the vote on uh, your initiative report. So we are really grateful that you could find the time to come and speak to us today. Uh, it's 11.25. Uh, uh, we were supposed to break at 11.30. We've been impeccable in timekeeping. Thanks to uh, all the speakers. Congratulations again to uh, Greece. And uh, uh, we now uh, take a coffee break and uh, I will uh, see you back at uh, 11.45 for uh, uh, the panel discussion chaired by uh, David Ward on uh, the road to 2030. How can we do better? That will be incredibly interesting. We have great uh, panelists. So uh, see you in uh, exactly 20 minutes. Thank you very much. OK. <laughs> well, everyone, hopefully everyone is back from their, their coffee break this morning. And um, so firstly, good morning to everybody, or I feel we should say Kalemeresas uh, Oli. Congratulations to Greece. So it's, it's bravo yatin elada. Um, I have to declare an interest. My wife is half Greek from the island of, of Greece. So I'm very proud of their achievements. And uh, actually, I've had personal experience. The, the road from Patras um, to Corinthos has been massively improved. So uh, I've, I've seen to my own eyes some of the benefits um, of improved infrastructure investment. Anyway, today, this afternoon, sorry, this morning, we have a fantastic uh, panel, um, six experts to contribute to uh, the deliberations that we've already uh, had such a good kickoff this morning. So we have Claire Dupre, who is the head of unit, uh, new head of unit uh, for road safety at the European Commission in DG Move. We have Ellen Townsend, who's the policy director at ETSC. Uh, Lars Ekman from the Swedish Transport Administration and one of the, the PIN partners. Uh, Professor Dr. Walter Eichendorf, president from uh, the German uh, Road Safety Council, also a partner of um, the PIN program. And Stefan van der Hende, who's from the cabinet of the Brussels Minister of Mobility. And last but not least, um, Chark, uh, Chark Kreutzinger from Toyota Motor Europe to give a perspective from, from industry. So to kick off this hour session, uh, we've got a lot to pack in, but we thought the obvious starting point is to look back um, and then look forward um, at uh, the performance of the EU. Um, particularly, what's, what's striking to me is that in the first decade uh, of this century, um, although we, the EU didn't hit the target, uh, performance was really pretty strong. Uh, in the last immediate decade, um, we've seen this worrying plateau. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a challenge there to understand what, why was the first decade better than the, uh, uh, than the last one. Uh, and so I'll, I'll really start, I think, on, on that perspective, um, to look back, uh, particularly at the last decade, and ask uh, all the panelists um, what uh, they think contributed the most to the achievements that we have seen, and what more is required. So I'm going to kick off, um, perhaps a little un unfairly, to ask Claire, put Claire on the, on the spot. Um, she, she, of course, has only recently joined, so you can be very honest, Claire, you can criticize, <laughs> you can criticize the past decade's performance because you weren't, you weren't there. So uh, anyway, uh, over to you, Claire, for your perspective on, um, on what went wrong, what went right um, over the last decade. Thank you so much for, for giving me the floor. Actually, I cannot really say that I was not really working on road safety. I have been uh, assistant to uh, one of the previous uh, director general and, and I was looking into road safety issues. Um, but I think that maybe uh, as, as a feeling, I think that you know, when, when you see a problem very big, uh, you often put a lot of effort in the beginning. And, and so it becomes more complicated, more difficult uh, to do uh, you know, to, to continue, um, you know, keeping the effort going, but also finding ways in which you can really uh, pinpoint to uh, the right cause of, uh, of the problem. And so I think that if, if I look back uh, beginning of uh, 2010, and I remember that time we were working on uh, uh, also one important white paper on transport, road safety was really uh, quite uh, uh, high at that time we immediately looked into specific measures. And so the big change I think here is, is also in trying to understand a lot more the causes of the problem so that indeed by getting more data, you can take the best advantage of this safe system approach that we are all pushing uh, forward at this moment in time. Um, and, and, and maybe I would also add that um, 
I think we also started from, from, uh, from a point where uh, each of us, public, private, within the public in terms of local, regional, uh, national, and EU, we're probably also working on our own areas of competencies, not maximizing opportunity enough. And so uh, I really look forward, um, or at least I, I, I certainly want to push forward uh, while I'm, I'm here as uh, um, head of unit for road safety, for more partnership, more cooperation. Uh, and at the end of the day, it does not matter so much who is actually in charge of the, the decision. Huh? What needs to be done is empowering. And I think that's a key word, empowering decision-making investment, uh, change in uh, in behaviors wherever the decision needs to, to be taken. Thank you. Great. Um, I think it's certainly striking that um, compared to the beginnings of the decade, we're much clearer now about the benefits of safe systems and this kind of partnership model. So there's a big opportunity to build, build on that. But now I'd like to uh, invite um, Ellen uh, Townsend, because ETSC has been an incredible advocacy force for for change and good uh, across the EU for, for many decades, but particularly in the last decade. So Ellen, what, what's your, your verdict on, on what worked and what was not so good? Where, where do we need to improve? Thanks very much, um, David. Uh, yeah, there's no real single explanation for why um, the progress stagnated um, up until uh, COVID hit us in, in 2020. Uh, for sure, um, at the beginning of the decade, for those first few years, we, we saw the impact of the implementation of some of the EU legislation that was adopted in the last decade. So the driving license directive, last, the last revision, um, the infrastructure safety directive, uh, some of the changes that were brought in from the last revision of the vehicle safety legislation. So they certainly gave a bit of a boost at the beginning, but uh, yeah, the other thing which was difficult was after the financial crisis, we had this recovery period where, where there was uh, well a lot of uh, a lot of exposure. Uh, the economy was 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 working um, to catch up. Um, at a national level, uh, there was um, an issue in terms of uh, political will, a lack of political will um, to develop and deliver comprehensive road safety strategies. We also think in our analysis uh, in our PIN reports um, uh, that this was part of the part of the problem. Um, cuts in enforcement budgets and infrastructure spending. I mean, we've seen um, in Greece, there's been, that's been a bit the opposite. They have been focusing in um, investing in infrastructure, improving uh, their highway network. Um, but there are some other really stellar examples of strong road safety leadership. So France, uh, reducing their speed limit on uh, rural roads from 90 to 80, that has certainly saved lives. Spain managed a minus 45% reduction. Um, also brought down uh, legal speed limits on rural roads. Uh, and now very recently, um, introduced uh, new 30k um, rules for urban roads. They're also talking of 30k, that's the last point, um, maybe uh, on, on what has gone well. Um, some cities uh, have been showing leadership. Uh, we have Stefan here from, from Brussels, but um, an inspiration I know also for Brussels has been uh, Helsinki and Oslo, who managed to uh, reach zero pedestrian and cyclist deaths in 2019. Um, so uh, there has, there certainly have been some very positive, strong um, areas of performance. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we can do, we can and have to do a lot better for, for 2030. Great, that I've really resonates with me, this problem of political will and uh, reflect, sitting as I am in, in Kent in the UK at the moment, uh, reflect on the story about the UK. It's rather disappointing to see the UK performing so badly in the table that, was, that Antonio showed earlier where we're one of the least improved. And um, there the UK dropped having a, uh, a specific target. And then the experience of austerity with cuts and so on. Um, and that clearly is an example um, not, not to follow. Uh, but it'd be interesting to hear from other member states. Um, so I'm going to ask Lars from Sweden to talk about, of course, Sweden's been pioneering safe systems and vision zero for a long time now, um, but always Sweden is, is up there amongst the, the, the countries that are the most interesting to hear from. So over to you, Lars. Thanks a lot. 
And um, yeah, it, I should say it's a, it, the first thing that strikes me actually that is that it's possible to to do something. I mean, you could see this from a from a, a half empty or half full glass. Uh, and I think the 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 very good thing is that it's actually possible to to do something. And I I also want to emphasize the uh, the role of encouragement here uh, that ETSC is actually the uh, the best I should say to encourage uh, improvement uh, because our problems when it comes to stagnation is actually that we was very encouraged and, and very enthusiastic but I think we were a little bit too satisfied and and and. Uh, and um, thought that we, we could do the easy things and we didn't want to, to really uh, go into the, the hard work because traffic safety is, is a long, long term uh, uh, race. It, it's it's to, to be more relevant today is to say it's, it's more of a marathon race than, than a sprint. So it's a hard work and we need to, to be working more proactive with the key performing indicators and so on. And I think the, the new th thing that should create the new enthusiasm, at least in Sweden, is to be, if we are able to, to put safety as a vital part of sustainability uh, in line with the, the Stockholm Declaration, I think that is what we need to, to take the, the, the new step, to be more working more proactive um, uh, with this. And um, uh, I don't see any other um, um, simple answer to this then rather than we are we are still in one way um, assuming that uh, fatalities in, in traffic is inevitable and it's not something normal uh, because we otherwise we should have done more uh, if we realize the, uh, the the consequences of this but I think the the way to create an encouragement uh, and enthusiasm for this is is really vital. And I think that the putting traffic safety as part of sustainability uh, is one of the, the key uh, ways to get forward. Great, thanks. Um, now I'm, I'm going to turn to Walter, of course, not, not speaking as it were, uh, as a member state, but as a very influential organization in Germany um, on the issues of road safety. So, um, Professor uh, Akinov, what, what's your perspective on particularly what, what you feel has not been brilliant in the past? We're going to discuss in a minute um, what to do next. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, yeah, it's uh, good and bad. We have seen both. The good thing is that road safety in Germany was improved over decades through the commitment of many, many actors. Since 1991, the number of people killed in traffic fell by over 70%. And also during the past decade, there was a significant decline of 24% from 2011 to 2020. Nevertheless, the positive trend is slowing down in Germany as in many other countries. And the 2020 number is of course a bit spoiled by COVID-19. A good thing is that the coalition agreement of the current federal government really was a stage victory for us at DVR. Vision Zero became a mandate to the federal government. Mm -hmm. And at the state level, Vision Zero is standard repertoire in the coalition agreements of the governing parties all over Germany. Another thing that really went well is concerning cyclists. We did a huge step forward because since 2002, a national cycling program exists and funding opportunities for the improvement of cycling infrastructure. Actually, the money in this program has considerably been improved uh, this year. However, Germany still has to do a lot to become a cycling country which is a clear aim of the government. And uh, last but not least, one important project did not work. The road safety strategy from 2011 to 2020 was well designed, but the regional and local authorities did not support it. They felt it was something 
by the federal government and not their business. Therefore, this project was partly successful, but we had hoped for much more. Mm, that's, that's very interesting. That delivery mechanism down to localities is, is so important, and um, which is a very nice link to my next, uh, the ne our next contributor, which is uh, Stefan um, uh, van der Hender from, from the Brussels Ministry of Mobility. So again, if you could focus on what you think went well and uh, not so good in the past, we'll, we'll come look in the future in a minute. Thank you. Um, I have to be honest, I haven't been around for all of the decade in, in road safety and mobility policy. A decade ago, I was still in university, so I can't give the whole overview. What I can say in Brussels, um, what I think didn't go as well in the last decade was that for a long time, um, uh, road safety policy wasn't an integral part of mobility policy. Well, it really should be. Um, it was, for example, uh, um, between different ministers, a uh, policy wise, which doesn't make sense. And I think we have not in Brussels, we've now started taking the first test, but we haven't really seen the full systemic change that's really needed across the board to really go to that, to that vision zero. Um, um, cars have still become bigger, traffic has still been increasing uh, until recently in Brussels. But I think what's good is that we've seen we're winning hearts um, public pressure bottom up in Brussels in the last couple of years has really been incredible. Um, people are really sick and tired of, of dangerous traffic. People see examples abroad like Helsinki and Oslo that were already mentioned, or even in Ghent in Belgium, for example, of how cities for people can really be safe and, and agreeable and people want it in their, in their street, in their neighborhood, in their town, uh, country. Um, and we can see it's becoming an international movement more and more, huh? the UN Love 30 campaign now. And also in Brussels now, um, we finally adopted the Vision Zero two years ago. So here's one regional government at least who's ready to really implement and and then go for this Vision Zero zero in the years to come. Uh, and I think that, that winning hearts is a good thing we've done in Brussels so far. And it's not just from, it's really bottom up. It's not from politics. It was forced onto politics. Sure. In a lot of cases. Just well, thanks. I um, I now want to bring in uh, Chark from um, Toyota. Uh, and one thing that strikes me is if you compare the the first two decades, clearly in the first decade there was a big vehicle um, effect arising from decisions in the late 1990s, which made a big improvement on um, uh, on occupant protection. But then the challenge now is is shifting more to vulnerable road users. Um, but there, there were some important initiatives um, uh, from industry uh, in the last decade. So, Chuck, can you give us your perspective from a, uh, an OEM view on, on these challenges? Of course. Per, for, thank you very much, David. I think uh, it's, it's very important to, to consider what has been very strong. And I think that, as you said, end of 90s regulation has done a lot. And I think that um, the establishment of, of assessment has also ra raised the awareness of safety and also made it a product that customers were willing to have and also to consider in their choice of vehicle. That was a very important step because that is, that is uh, similar to a behavioral change um, so that brings me to the other dimension that, of course, vehicles have to improve, infrastructure has to improve, and also behavior, because that is just like like the um, the matrix that we have to deal with. So, um, but that is now, of course, uh, the low hanging fruits. I've seen one comment, which is also bringing it right there. So, earlier improvements were quicker and easier, and now it is more difficult to find where are the spots where we can reach most in improving road safety, and that is. Um, one of the reasons why I like personally to work very much with uh, ETSC because um, they are very much fact-based, they try to understand and all the members of ETSC are trying to improve the knowledge about how accidents happen and how injuries are, uh, are caused. And uh, I think that is a key for the future. We, we have to improve our knowledge about uh, what happens out there, about how to improve um, uh, vehicle, but also infrastructure, and also how to reach people better, because I think that's in that's also a key issue. I live in Belgium, as not the only one here in the panel, and I, I, I like, for example, the educational campaigns because they reach people sometimes uh, on a spot that you can, as a car maker, for example, never do. Uh, only mentioning the Bob campaign, so who is who's uh, uh, driving shouldn't shouldn't drink, even among young people. I hear my 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 son that they also decide who's Bob. That's a very good example. So that's very important. 
I think that what is uh, um, now one other dimension that I would like to say is, in the end, everything that you change and you do uh, will be borne by an investment. And uh, when I look at how much the society is willing to consider health, I think that uh, road safety is a health issue. It should also be seen as one. And then I think it can be better understood that setting priority on road safety is a very important thing for the society. And it's not an individual thing. It's, it shouldn't be down to the choice of individual people to choose safety. Sure. That's well, something that's, like my image around it. Yeah. Well, I think uh, moving, looking forward, um, maybe I can try and sort of paint a rather stark picture is that we've, um, we've come out of this unique uh, or coming out of this very unique challenge of the, of the pandemic. And that's affecting um, hugely our mobility and patterns of work and life. Um, on the other hand, we have um, this, this target, which we've not yet met in each decade um, to halve deaths and serious injuries by 2030. And that is, is a step. It's only a step towards um, the goal of, of Vision Zero by 2050, which the, the Commission has adopted and which was also reflected in the Stockholm Declaration. So um, uh, my feeling is that the next decade is going to be absolutely critical. Um, we've kind of run out of excuses for not, um, not really delivering on the targets we set. And if we don't achieve our target uh, to reach um, halving by 2030, we're really jeopardizing uh, the ultimate destination that we want uh, by 2050. So, um, there are some really significant challenges facing us. Um, uh, I think um, Matthew mentioned earlier the concern about the um, possible increases in vehicle use now arising from the pandemic. And if those become lasting, we, we face some, some really big challenges. So I'd like to do one more round where um, perhaps with that, that rather um, challenging and maybe a bit gloomy prospect, um, what are we really going to do to make sure we hit this target by 2030? So I'm going to pass the ball back to Claire um, on that one. Maybe if I, if I can be a little bit long, I think it's, it's starting by changing mission statement. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe make a, a little bit of an analogy. I've been working on, uh, on several other dimensions, but one of these being intelligent transport system. And while we have progressed a lot on that, uh, on that sector, we were trying to make sure that flows you know, would, would work uh, in an optimal manner. While we were discussing a lot more with infrastructure managers or those responsible for infrastructure, they, they, they said to us, you know, at the end of the day, uh, with, the, with the European Green Deal agenda, with the, the reinforcement focus when it comes to road safety, actually uh, our mission statement change. It's not only about organizing flow, is actually what you expect, how you expect uh, um, road safety also to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be supported. So I think it's, it's really start by changing mission statement from those actors that can play a role in road safety. And that is also why actually those strategies, those national strategies on road safety are important because precisely they are able to bring different uh, the different actors um, uh, together. I also think that we have moved from passive safety. We discuss a lot about active safety. Safety. I think that maybe for the next round, we should look at cooperative safety. I'm responsible of others and also others are responsible uh, for me. And I think that if we look at speed, that's a little bit, um, we reduce speed because we know that uh, uh, I, I should not be the only one to be protected, either in a car, either on a bike, bicycle, either on a, on a moped. Um, and so uh, with all this, and, and I really want to get back to, uh, uh, to, to, to the data at the end of the day, uh, better understanding the causes of the accident quickly. Uh, so trying to put all of us a lot of effort in that uh, um, in, the, in that area would also help us to, uh, to be able to take the decision uh, swifter, more effective, and also at the, right, uh, at the right place. So it's not, of course, all about EU legislation. Uh, so keep quiet, we won't regulate on all aspects, but certainly, and I go back to my empowerment, we certainly want to help. And so I'm there to do that. Great. 
I'm going to jump over and I'm going to give Ellen the last word in this in this roundup. But uh, I want to come back to Lars. And um, uh, I know that the shared responsibility has always been a key theme of Vision Zero. But there is a danger in shared responsibility of it can be seen sometimes an evasion that it's shared and so no one's in charge. So I'd like to ask Lars in particular from a Swedish perspective, how do we make sure that there's accountability in this system? Because it seems to me that meeting this target by 2030, we're gonna to have to see some really strong accountability action. Uh, yeah, th yeah, that's, that's, that's really uh, true. Um, that, um, that, that has been a, a really a problem that uh, even if it's, so delightful to hear all talking so natural about Vision Zero today. I mean, I remember when, when, when we presented it, we were a laughing stock, but now it's natural. But the hard thing now is actually to do actions. And when we got our plateau panic, so to say, what we realized that we have failed to do what we should have done when it comes to speed. We have too high speed on, uh, roads without a mid barrier. We have two high speeds in urban areas. And we thought that there was, that was someone else's decision. And that was not as fancy as the new three digit, uh, digitalization issues and things like that. So I think that's what we, where we found that we need to go down to, to these fundamentals like, like uh, reducing speed. And that has been a huge struggle because people understand that they don't want access, but the connection to that we're driving too fast on rural roads or in urban areas, that is a real challenge. And we got lots of complaints about our uh, plan to reduce speed on relatively nice roads, people thought. Uh, but luckily we had the support from, from our government and our highest level in, in, in uh, Swedish Transport Administration to do that. And that was because we had this panic of, 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 of um, uh, plateauing. So, so I think that we need to do that. And that's where we need to, to work more with the, the key performing indicators because we need to see actions taking place. So uh, the next step, because we also realized that we are very late on the actions that should have an effect on 2030. And when it comes to infrastructure, 10 years is a very, very small, small time period. So we need to be very uh, much more proactive and work much harder to, to, to achieve things. Um, so, and, and key performing indicator is the good thing that they focus in on things that should be done and that we need to plan to be, to, to, to be done. So now um, I'd just like to ask Walter, I was very struck by um, the resistance you identified around the regional and local authorities. And I wonder how uh, looking forward in the next decade with this encouraging story about Vision Zero being mandated in the coalition agreements, how do you think in Germany you will translate this um, really down the, the decision-making chain to, the, to, to local communities? Well, actually, it did work much better now. We have a road safety program 21 to 2030, which the government has officially adopted on the 2nd of June. And it took one and a half years in advance where we had a real large set of stakeholder involvement. The Lindo were involved, the cities were involved, the rural areas were involved and all the organizations around uh, the car industry, the motor clubs, they were all part of it. So this safety program for the 10 years to come, also having clear targets, is one where everybody was involved in formulating it. And we do hope that after the 2nd of June, the government has officially adopted it. Now everybody in Germany feels I am part of it. We have a few things that are in the program, which we like a lot. It clearly says that Vision Zero should be part of the Road Traffic Act. So for the first time, we would have it in the law. Mm -hmm. Shortly before the road safety program, we had a law for highly autonomous driving 
it's actually precisely level four that has passed parliament on the 22nd of May. And both mark important steps for more safety on our roads. Where we do see difficulties still and DVR is pushing, pushing and pushing the federal government. That is a sanction system for traffic law violations. The level of sanctions must reflect the potential risk of a traffic violation in order to have a preventive effect. And I think all of you know that compared to most European countries, the level of sanctions in Germany is very low. The good thing we are exactly on your uh, question, David, it really worked is safety of cyclists. We have an updated national cycling program with specific targets and it describes clearly national, regional, municipal level and the stakeholders. And there again, it did work. It was a long process, but everybody who was a stakeholder concerning safety of cyclists was involved and now it is official. So concerning the road safety program until 2030 and also the national cycling program, I'm quite confident that now it can work. But it is certainly true what has been said twice already. 2030 is not far away. And if we are not really successful in these few years, then there is no chance to reach 2050. Interesting. And I think what, what's striking about what you're saying and the other contributors too is that there is this sort of in, intersection between uh, different trends. So while we're moving toward, uh, towards more healthy transport systems and cycling, we also have continuing issues with speed and maybe increasing volumes and so on. So there are some, there are some contradictions we're facing, um, which leads me toward uh, Stefan. I mean, we've, we've been very impressed by uh, the decision in, in, in Belgium uh, sorry, in Brussels to go for uh, low speed uh, zones, 30, uh, 30 kmh. Um, how, how have you overcome resistance to this? And how confident are you that you will be able to build on this success um, in the next, uh, the next few years? Um, so uh, actually to correct you slightly, it's not a zone 30, it's a city 30. So what we've yeah. done is really we've changed the standard everywhere with some with then the exceptions becoming the actual exceptions in law as well. We have that power as a regional government, uh, luckily for us. And so um, we're trying to credibilize it by one, uh, one way to tackle opposition, I think, is to have a communication plan ready. We had one ready that really talked benefits, 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 you know, noise pollution, uh, uh, really show the difference between um, uh, uh, 30 to 50, make it really personal to people, um, uh, make it really visual. I mean, people can have a look on, on city30.brussels, uh, how, how the campaign looked like. Um, I think then um, one way to really also convince people is just to implement it, I think. Um, once it's there, the standard you see, or we see in Brussels that actually it has reduced uh, speeds on average, uh, while journey times have not increased, while pollution, as far as we know now, has not increased, though so we're waiting for the full results. Um, and, and really showing people that it makes a difference already, that traffic becomes calmer, becomes less stressful, um, and has a huge increase. And I think there, where it's working well, I think then also accompanying it with a strong enforcement measures, um, you know, have a plan ready, communicate about how you will enforce it. And then, you know, even if it's not 100% in place yet, rolling out that in those enforcement measures. The same thing also with, with infrastructure. I think people always wait until all, or a lot of people would say, you know, you need to wait until the infrastructure is, is ready before implementing lower speeds. But I don't think that's really needed. And I don't think we have time to wait for that. Uh, changing roads takes a lot more time than changing the speeds. And that can be done gradually. Um, also, um, uh, uh, once you've reduced speed uh, or the, the maximum speed already. And I think one thing we've seen is that you can actually use NIMBY against those oppo th that opposition. People always want a lower speed in their own street. Um, and they then think that it's okay to, to you know, drive quicker in the streets just across the road or just a bit further. 
and actually we've seen examples of of places in brussels where you know once we do actually um we we, we check with people you know we do a, a little survey in a, in a neighborhood and we check with people and people on their own street they want um slower speeds and then they say you know across the road i want i want it a bit faster and then if you confront people they're like okay actually yeah uh, you know there's sit there's people living everywhere and then you know that that gives a mentality change and um, so i think those are different ways to really get people along and, and build a story around your 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 zone 30 or in our case a city 30. Mm, interesting so i uh, know just on the the vehicle side of this story i was i was I'm so ancient, I was involved in the very origins of Euro NCAP and um, back in 1996. And I remember at the time, um, fierce resistance from uh, ASEA to the very modest proposals we, we were proposing for occupant protection. Now we're in a completely different era. I mean, if I had been told when I was in the first ever meetings of the board of Euro NCAP that the, to get a five star car now would require the kind of extraordinary ratings that are included. Um, I wouldn't have believed it. So there's been this extraordinary progress, and we're we're also now about to see um, the application of the GSR package, um, which is a shift. I think a really significant shift, um, uh, particularly towards vulnerable user protection. So, from an OEM perspective, and we've got a lot to celebrate here, Chuck, about what vehicles have done. But what are they going to do next, and how geared up is the industry for the GSR package? That's indeed, I think, a major step. Uh, GSR is implementing really a full array of, of topics. And I think that um, uh, as, a, as a safety engineer by heart, which I have been in safety now for more than 20 years, and David, probably we have met many times in, the, in these years, and it was always a very fruitful debate. We do not always have to agree, but we have to find a consensus. And that, that's, that's what is also, I deeply believe in this idea of continuous improvement, which is also uh, never give up uh, um, and accept and get complacent. So I think uh, the technology that we will have to look into that's the question precisely now to me is a lot around how to assist the driver to do even better because it's still the human error that is the biggest reason for 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 um accidents uh, i'm not bold enough to say that i know about all the nitty-gritty details but it is still the driver who's making mistakes but they don't want to make mistakes so what we what we call uh, advanced driver assistance systems will play a fundamental role i think we need to know better. We need to, as I said previously, uh, learn more about the, the causation of accidents. But I think um, to bring the driver in its best position to deal with the environment and the road situation is the, the best that we have to do. I don't think honestly that what everybody is now expecting is that automated driving as such will do it because the automated driving is not solving that, that problem per se. Because honestly, that humans are still the most skilled operator of vehicles that we know and that is why i think um that is the key message that i believe um i want to give that we, we have to bring the driver in the position to do his and her best and then all the rest will come automatically be it self-protection protection of others compatibility um and also um uh, the vulnerable road users around because also for them, I think uh, it is important to understand what is best for them. So I'm not letting down on, on um, education, on changes in the uh, um, policy. Um, like I think I, I agree that what process has done is very important. It is also raising an awareness that this is an important topic. Um, and I remember when we had still, I think, even 60 kilometers per hour in, uh, in city roads in Belgian and regions. And that was, that was dramatic, honestly. Um, and I'm also not uh, um, willing to let down on passive safety, which is still to be improved because our um, systems, if we're honest, are designed based on crash test dummies that have been designed fundamentally back in the 70s based on American redneck soldiers. And my mom is none of them and she's still driving in a car. Mm. And uh, I'm also getting older, unfortunately, every day. So I think there is still a lot to do. Interesting. So I'm now for this bit, I, I'm going to ask Ellen to sort of wrap up on and uh, she, she has the opportunity now to set the whole agenda for the next decade and uh, ETSC is entitled to that. <laughs> That's their main role. So Ellen, over to you. You give us our orders. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And then please also give Claire the word because I see that she has her hand up uh, oh, after, sorry, after yeah, me. Yeah. So um, 
we think that speed is of the essence, meaning we need to work on speed. That will be uh, uh, coming up in our discussion, but also be quick about it. Um, so don't wait to implement uh, what's in the EU uh, strategy. We already heard from Matthew and Claire that, of course, work is uh, work has already kicked off. Um, but some of the legislation in the last decade uh, came quite late. Um, so cross-border enforcement, driving license directive. Um, we, you know, we need to work hard. I mean, it was also mentioned by Walter and Lars. 2030 is just around the corner. Um, also look at what we can do um, in terms of focusing on uh, the, the main risk factors. So speed, alcohol and drugs. Um, we don't think that we have exhausted uh, the low hanging fruit. So um, Ireland was one of the countries that um, had a back to basics campaign on um, speed, alcohol, seat belts. Um, then, yeah, the other point in terms of road users that we need to focus on, so uh, cycling, vulnerable road users um, have to be a priority in the next decade, cyclists and pedestrians, but I pick out cyclists because there was a zero, I mean, there was a zero improvement in the last decade. Um, pedestrians, we had a minus 19% uh, um, reduction versus the 24% reduction of, uh, of car occupants. Um, so for that, we need to focus on uh, um, improving vulnerable road safety in, especially in urban areas. So speed management, of course, there, supported by enforcement and infrastructure will help. We also need to follow through on some of the legislation that came in uh, in the last decade. So um, general safety regulation has been mentioned. Um, preparing for automation and uh, looking at the new infrastructure safety directive. So trying to encourage member states at the moment to uh, designate the largest amount of primary roads, because it's up to them to decide. Um, and then maybe the last one um, also been mentioned, we, we also very much support um, the new KPIs, so this new management approach, um, which has also been demonstrated, um, explained very well by Lars in Sweden. So um, yeah, we need to collect the data, analyze the data, and then act on what the data tells us. Um, uh, there we are. Great. Claire, you wanted to, I'm going to ask you to comment on the speed very quickly, but... Um... Okay, just one thing on, on the GSR. I think what we should not forget is uh, the GSR brings all these new safety features everywhere in Europe at the same time. And for me, that's one of the major uh, advantage. Huh? Otherwise, and it's normal, you know, you start developing project um, feature, and, and then they start uh, being introduced in the higher uh, um, uh, and, and maybe more costly type of vehicle. So sometimes also for certain markets. And so here the huge benefit is quick, not dirty, quick and everywhere. So this is Europe, which is inclusive. Huh? Yeah. Um, so that I wanted to flag it. But then I have heard uh, Ellen uh, pushing me and she's right, uh, she's right to do so. So a few things here about what we um, have mentioned in the sustainable and uh, smart mobility strategy where road safety is mainstream in, in a lot of very different uh, areas, but very much to support um, the targets and the objective that we had already uh, uh, established. So yes, we are already working on driving licenses. I've seen some comments in the chat room about the need to work on, uh, uh, on behavior. Uh, and absolutely it will be there. Uh, uh, maybe I'm not entirely wrong if I say that maybe I'm one of the youngest driver in the panel, have taken my driving licenses 10 years ago. Um, and I'm very much happy that in Belgium already at that time we were pushing a lot in terms of uh, awareness about the surrounding and not only about the capacity to, uh, to manage a vehicle. Um, but that's the beginning. Huh? That's the beginning. I think we, we, we should think about moving from getting a license, a document that allow you to drive into, uh, uh, well, keeping fit for purpose, which is not only medical. Huh? Fit for purpose is also me uh, uh, acknowledging that, let's say, uh, mobility uh, has changed on the road, mix is different, I need to be uh, taken care of um, a lot of others uh, on the streets, and maybe also taking better advantage of technology inside the vehicle. So, it's not only about the product being there, but also how I'm uh, able to uh, to use it. Uh, can I, I? I need. We need to move on to the next bit, but we'll come back to you. Don't 
<laughs> in fact, very soon, I'm, I'm just going to um, highlight, I mean, speed has come up uh, all the time. Uh, and if uh, it's very dangerous to talk about silver bullets, but if there's one unifying issue, particularly from a safe systems perspective, it's the, it's the need to manage speed better. Uh, this stark number here, just a small improvement in speed delivers uh, impressive life-saving potential. So I really want to focus um, one quick round on, on speed. Um, and we know there are problems about the, um, the, the authority of the commission to the subsidiarity issues, but how can we see um, the EC really playing a stronger role on, on tackling speed, um, encouraging better um, member states' uh, responses in this area? So Claire, back, back to you for a, a, a quick round from everybody on speed. So certainly we don't have uh, we don't have the competence to regulate on everything, but certainly where we can help is is try to bring this topic in a very uh, uh, systematic manner. So it's about the limits, it's about speed management, it's about uh, enforcement, as Ellen has been uh, saying. Um, I have already discussed a lot with uh, with member states, and I also hear that uh, uh, sometimes, let's say, enforcing also at the level of a local authorities it's much more complicated than doing it in uh, in the uh, in the larger axis and, and primary road so we should look into those issues uh, we should really again empower and making sure that once you know uh, brave brave decisions are taken well there are also means to get uh, to get them uh, uh, implemented so it, it's about working on all those uh, dimension. Uh, we are progressing still internally at this moment in time. So um, we are tackling, uh, we are uh, looking at the topic from, from different angles and with the support of different uh, colleagues. So I hope that we will be able to come back to you uh, soon with uh, some progress in this field. Could you, could you tell me about this idea of a speed of a recommendation, a policy a recommendation? How quickly is that likely to emerge? Well, as I said, we are really taking, let's say, uh, the topic very high on, on the agenda, having a lot of discussion internally with, uh, uh, with, our, with our bosses and then trying to bring forward, let's say, the, the, the value of uh, further action on speed in terms of road safety. You, many of you have said 30, 2030 is, uh, is actually tomorrow if we don't take the right decision. And so uh, I think that maybe we should not uh, keep road safety in the position of, of the EU. You know, in the EU, you progress when you have crisis. Let's not wait until we get the big road safety crisis to then realize uh, the need for, uh, for more yeah. brief action. Yeah, quite right. So um, uh, I think I'm going to ask uh, Stefan a particular question, because it's, it's how do you deal with the, the so-called noisy minority? Uh, how do you mobilize the silent majority, which I think you are hinting is, is strongly evidence? Because that, at a particular local level, that can be a, a problem. Yeah, I think uh, it comes back to what I said earlier. I think it's really showing people, I think a lot of people are undecided, also in the silent uh, majority. And once you show them um, what a difference it makes to, to, to bring down that speed uh, with a couple of kilometers, you really increase that that uh, the, the, the local support and i think for us what really helped is really making it visual um what the benefits are of adapted speeds what the benefits are of these these things and make it personal you know show them that you know if you uh, are driving at 50 kilometers per hour and you hit a pedestrian a pedestrian or you as a pedestrian have have about 20 percent of survival if it's at 30 you know you have 80 percent of survival people understand that kind of imagery uh, that you can also show in in, 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 in campaigns and stuff um, and, and really make that that personal um, touch you know show that you know everywhere where they drive people are living people want to you know walk across the street safely um, uh, cycle safely and you know then uh, at the same time I think showing them that you know the the the, the maximum limits are not there you know you know to get money for the government that they're there for very good reasons you know for safety reasons and you know showing people that you're serious about enforcing them also credibilizing them you know in brussels we're rolling out a lot of um uh, um uh, uh, speed um radars i don't know what the, cameras, I actually can't remember cameras, what yeah, yeah. cameras of course yes. um uh, speed cameras and really enforcing them and i think if, if you if you show 
if you show the people that are supporting it that you're serious about it, if you then get, you know, really uh, talk about benefits, benefit, benefit, I think you can you can activate that um, uh, that uh, that's that that silent majority for a small part. And I think there's also a growing minority of activists, at least in Brussels, that are very vocal about their support and that want us to to go further. And it's it's giving you know going into dialogue with them, helping them you know, uh, uh, bring their message across in a way, translating that politically, that really helps uh, in, you know, creating a, a much broader coalition for, for road safety uh, in a city or, or region like Brussels. Yeah. Great. Well, I'd uh, like to ask Lars just to talk briefly about the, um, Sweden has used KPIs on speed, uh, particularly effectively. And um, uh, just if you've got any quick lessons on, on that and how that might be applied. Is Lars still there? We've lost Lars. So uh, I have two ways oh, to go. mute. I have two ways to mute. That's a problem. <laughs> no, the, the, um, the quick lesson is that it, it's very hard. But I think that's an area where we have had greatest difficulties to take the system designer's perspective, responsibility. We still blame the, the road user for, for, for speeding and for not understanding the, the, uh, the importance of, of driving at too high speed when we still design new roads that not, are not even capable for the most modern vehicles to have a survivable crash in. So, so that's an area where we need to step up a lot to take our responsibility. And the way we have done it in, in our KPI is actually to highlight that. And that, and that is also a, a very hard work to do. As I said, we have struggling for years and years to get more adequate or speed more in harmony with the, 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 the safety standards on the road. I mean, it could be the case that you could increase speed because you have a, a safer road, but if you haven't, you should reduce speed. And I, I think that's an area where we, where we have failed to take the responsibility uh, as system designer, as authority or whatever. We still blame the, the, the road users for don't understand that. And we will never have the, the big majority to understand the, the danger of, of, of high speed. I think we have to learn something from, from, the, from the COVID area uh, or the COVID uh, pandemic things where we could have said, well, distance is good, stay at home is good. But where we really as a society have stepped in and said, well, that means that we uh, uh, prohibit uh, big uh, gathering of people and things like that because we understand the danger and each individual don't so i think there is a is a room for a really stepping up when it comes to to speed and taking the system uh, designer's perspective on that okay and then briefly uh walter um speed in germany it's always a very hot topic but um particularly what about rural roads um should they be reduced uh 80 km K, kph lower well, actually, David, that is one of the problems that has been solved. Uh, we have a recommendation for a speed limit of 80 on narrow rural roads and an introduction of a general speed limit on motorways in DVR taken by our board. The 80 kilometers per hour resolution for narrow roads did not reach the law, but it has become reality in most of Germany. Our resolution to introduce a general speed limit on motorways is a hot topic, you're right. It was well received by the media. It reflects the opinion of more than 60% of the population. And if you look into the program of the political parties for our September federal election this year, one of the big parties has included specifically a legal limit of 130 on the autobahn and at least one more is positive toward this idea so we may soon see a change on german motorways interesting um i'd now like to ask chuck to comment about uh, a particular issue on isa um, there's going to be a, a slide shown uh, hopefully any second now because this is a huge transformation um, to see ISA finally being introduced. And so there's a, there's a very specific um, issue here, which is which 
uh, for, for Toyota, which system would you like? And also, I want to ask a, a, another question, which is Volvo and Renault um, have recently announced that they will fix a maximum speed limit to their new, new vehicles of 180. Um, is that something that Toyota would also consider? Of course, I think that we all are aware that speed has been a very heat debate over the last years. And I think that in the GSR, um, uh, everybody who has been involved has had a very uh, difficult time finding a good compromise. I personally think that this compromise is not so bad that we have. I think it will, it's a very important step to reduce inappropriate speed. And I think that also the interest in this is so high that there's just no way around that. <clears throat> that ISA is something that is, is, is the most appropriate thing to do. Um, for the first thing, um, your question on the slide, I don't have the exact wording anymore. I think that um, the, the importance of overridable, I think there is no doubt by most people involved. And I, th I think this is also an important part, but it should be very well dis distinguishable for the driver. So that's again, a little bit to what I said before. So I, there must be no doubt for the driver that he or she is deciding to go above the speed limit. And therefore, I think that a function like the, the kick down or empty stroke, as you can call it, is the right way because it's a haptic feedback <clears throat> and it's giving no doubt. I mean, who has ever driven an automatic vehicle that also knows the kick down function and a lot of the speed limiters currently out on the market do it. And we have good feedback also from customers. So that is maybe the first part of the answer. I hope I responded to that. So a good haptic feedback, I think, is the best way. Okay, good. And, and uh, any any possibility of avoiding building all this excess capacity in the vehicle that can do, you know, way above the speed limit? I mean, it's a very significant step for a company like Volvo and Renault to say, <laughs> we're going to stop doing this. Maybe it has not been uh, communicated in the same way for the same technical reason, but practically all hybrid vehicles have a speed limiter in it. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> I think that my car is a hybrid and it doesn't go faster than 180 already uh, for, for years. So um, there is, a there is of course, especially if you're not in Germany, I think there's only one country in the world where it's allowed to go faster than 130. Um, so there is no, no need for that. Um, but I think that also it is difficult to um, say that this this must be a legal limit or that, that uh, um, it is the car maker who has to do it. Maybe, you know, in Japan, there, there is still implemented uh, um, an agreement among car makers uh, not to have cars that can go faster than 180, even if they are super sports cars. Um, and uh, I think that a lot of the premium car makers, and we are all also, we have a, a premium brand in our lineup with Lexus. Um, our customers still demand uh, let's say the horsepower that would make the car much faster. And I don't see actually that Renault or Volvo are reducing the horsepowers. Right. Okay, I'm not, I've been a rather lazy chairman. I've let, I've let the time slip a bit. So I'm gonna quickly run to our final topic. There's probably not gonna be much time to discuss it, but I, worth highlighting anyway. Um, so there's a couple of slides being shown about vans now. Um, and uh, we can see there's a, there's a high prominence now of vans uh, in uh, road, co road collisions across Europe. Uh, in my own area here in the southeast of England, uh, just in the last year, we've had a 25% increase in vehicle registrations for vans. And um, so they're becoming quite a significant problem. Also, Euro NCAP has just introduced some van testing. And uh, it's good, there's some positive results there. You'll be glad to see that uh, Toyota, Chark can relax because there's a, a Toyota there that gets a bronze award, not as, not as good as gold, but I'm sure they'll get there soon. But the next slide is really worrying. And it shows a huge load of vehicles um, which are not recommended at all. And uh, what Eurencap has shown is a big difference between uh, the levels of safety prevailing in passenger vehicles as compared to vans. Um, now, as, as, uh, as Claire pointed out, um, in fact, because of the GSR, some of these improvements are going to come uh, automatically everywhere. Uh, but I would like to kick off, maybe I'll, I'm going to ask Chark again, you to respond, what can we do to get van safety uh, at, the, at the level of the best, best available technologies and as good as passenger cars? Um, I think that, first of all, 
I can see, say that there is no reason why vans should be less safe than, than any other vehicle. So I think uh, what you see here is some examples that I'm, I'm also a bit surprised, honestly. Um, it is largely uh, because of the lack of um, support systems. And that is where I keep obviously coming back to the same thing. Uh, this, is, this is where uh, improvements are uh, needed. So um, that also these vehicles benefit from the advancement of, of technology. Um, of course, uh, these vehicles, they usually have a very long lifetime. And that is also a little bit reflected here because you, you see that the, the good performers are always brand new cars. Um, uh, so that's a challenge. And th that is also difficult to, to uh, recover from because um, it is just what it is. A car that has been launched three, four years ago will not be relaunched in a new model very quickly. And this kind of advanced functions in retrofit is, is difficult to, to have an eye on. But nevertheless, I think that this is also where GSR is playing an important role, that it is also leveling the uh, segments, including also these vehicles. And Claire, could I ask you, what, what do you think about the whole agenda of workplace road safety? I mean, arguably the, the commission could be doing a lot more in workplace road safety, uh, issues of tachographs and making these requirements, um, the requirements for HGVs also uh, for, for van drivers. Um, is this an area where the Commission can do quite a bit more? There were recently uh, improvements to do. Uh, just to know that with the uh, Mobility uh, Package 1, uh, there were new rules introduced when it comes to driving time and rest period where light commercial vehicles were included for the international transport nonetheless. But uh, uh, so the, th those kind of vehicles and let's say the use that is made of those kind of vehicles should come into the picture um, uh, as of 2026, but maybe I also wanted to draw the attention to the initiative Matthew was referring uh, to in uh, uh, in um, in his uh, keynote speech. So, speech we 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 are working with our colleagues uh, from DG uh, uh, Employment, where they are looking at uh, workers' conditions in um, in the platform economy. Uh, uh, so. Of course, they are not necessarily targeting the transport sector, and we'll be looking at this topic from, from a much broader angle. But certainly, let's say, when we see how much transport has evolved, or is changing also uh, through uh, digitalization and opportunity that uh, emerge from that, I think that we have entered to again mainstream uh, road safety in other type of agenda, make sure that actually, uh, indeed, road safety is a topic of uh, the health of um, of uh, platform workers and so we are engaging with them we are trying to make sure that you know uh, the needs of the transport sector are duly uh, represented over there and uh, and as we have also highlighted in the very beginning i, I really want to make use also of uh, this uh, european road safety charter uh, to stimulate improve uh, make sure that we can get uh, many more uh, voluntary agreement when it comes to corporate uh, road safety Okay, then I think a last word to Ellen. Um, as usual, ETSE should get the last word on all of this. Thank you. Thanks very much. I know we're running, well, we've run out of time. time. So thanks to all of you who are still here, 134 of you. Well done. Um, so uh, on vans, I want to link into the topic that we just uh, covered um, before speed. We're really concerned about high levels of speed. Uh, speeding vans, especially in in urban areas, um, how do we how do we manage that? Well, for sure, it's uh, looking at the vehicle side, intelligent speed assistance, or you know, top speed limiter for vans. They shouldn't be going over 130, but also how to bring the speeds down uh, using ISA um, in urban areas. Um, then looking at the supply chain, so um, procurement uh, and standards requirements. Um, risk assessment, um, which is needed by EU occupational health and safety law. Uh, and then lastly, it was also mentioned in the uh, Parliament report um, of um, Ms. Contour, which is going to be voted today and tomorrow. Uh, they also highlight the importance to take action on, on van safety, specifically um, uh, driver training. So, uh, for example, very concretely, uh, making the drivers themselves aware of the impact of if they're speeding through a 30k zone to drop off a new pair of trainers that someone's just ordered on Amazon. So I think there's a really a lot of potential uh, action uh, at European, national and city, city level as well with this upcoming urban mobility package as well. 
Thanks. Great. Well, I th uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm sorry to any of the other panelists. I haven't, haven't had you all commenting on those, this, the van issue, but I'm handing back to Antonio now and uh, uh, look forward to his, his concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thanks to all the panelists. It's been a great uh, debate. We've seen this also in the comments. Uh, the um, audience has certainly um, appreciated it. Well, uh, nothing much remains for me to do uh, apart from uh, thanking all uh, of those uh, who have uh, participated, the uh, um, speakers of the previous session, the panelists in this session, congratulate once again, uh, uh, Greece. And uh, uh, well, just to ask you to continue following us and uh, the colleagues should now uh, share one last slide. Uh, if you want to hear more from ETSC, next week on the 23rd of June, we will have uh, a webinar on uh, uh, the Learn Manual for Developing and Evaluating Traffic Safety and Mobility Education Activities. This will be uh, available online. All of you are encouraged to uh, register and uh, when it's time to uh, download the uh, publication. Thank you very much and have a nice and safe day. Thank you.